it's early in the morning and we got to get we got to get up we got to get moving uh and so sweet child of mine was the first thing that, that came to my my mind but it did it did strike me it'd be really fun to go around to all the nonprofits and see what their their favorite song was and put together a little spotify Ooh. sound soundtrack of uh of a little nonprofit songs yeah it'd be kind of fun so you know one of the other ones that we've done in the past has been uh, teach your children well and um so you know just some other stuff but this yeah. This this is a Friday song. It's a rocking song. We love it. Yeah. And you know, I I know that I had some of my friends out there who were doing the head nod. Yeah, I know you were. I know you're with us. <laughs> so, hey, so tell me everything that's going on with you, Will. We've got uh, something fun coming up real soon. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 here to talk primarily about our early childhood family resource fair, which is coming up on Saturday. Oh my gosh, tomorrow. How yeah. is it tomorrow already? Uh, it's coming up tomorrow um, from 10 a.m. to noon at Kennedy Early Childhood Center, which is 1605 Davis Road on the beautiful east side of Lawrence, Kansas. Um, we are going to have over 45 of our friends, resources uh, in the community that target and work with early childhood. Yeah. So there will be activities, games, supports, information. Uh, we're going to have our Block Fest play group uh, set up so that uh, kids and, and adults, if they want to, can play around with blocks. Trust me, it's hilarious fun. Uh, I always enjoy it when we do that programming on, on Thursdays. Uh, we're also going to have the Lord's Public Library is going to come and do a story time. Um, but it's a chance for families to come and, and have a little time together to learn about different programming that they might not know about. If you're interested in getting your kid into um, some sort of support or therapy or uh, sports or music or any, any of that that sort of thing, um, looking at different uh, child care centers and options um, moving forward. Uh, all of those resources will be there, uh, and it's an awesome opportunity for folks to get to know a little bit more about the early childhood scene. And we'll also be talking uh, with folks about our early upcoming early childhood care center, um, which is a new facility that we're building at 346 Main Street, uh, which is due to open in the fall of this year. It's very exciting. It will have um, 138 spots of child care. Uh, aimed at infants and toddlers. It will have a family resource center offering parental education support and uh, professional support for early childhood caregivers. Uh, and it'll have a free indoor play area, which I am so excited about because uh, having a little one of my own, like if it gets too cold or too hot, you really don't have anywhere free to take them. Uh, and this will be an option for that. So that's our big master plan, uh, which I'm sure I'll come on and talk about again as we get a little closer to that project being completed. But tomorrow uh, is an opportunity to come and learn more about that and everything else that's going on in early childhood in our community. Yeah, you know, we have enough uh, folks that are out there doing, trying to do and trying to help. But do we do we have enough places for all the kids that are in the community that need assistance? No, we're actually in a very significant child care crisis right now. Um, a combination of COVID and rising child care costs um, make it so that many folks um, are having a difficulty finding a, a place. If we, if every child from the age of uh, zero to five who wanted a slot went to get a slot at the same time, we would need an additional 3,000 child care slots in Douglas County. Um, and we've got some big new, you know, kind of industry coming in. So we're going to have more folks in the workforce. We're going to have folks moving here who are going to have families and children of their own. So that number is just going to get crunchier as we move forward. But what we're hoping we can do is not only provide these additional slots of care that are going to be 24-7. We're going to have an overnight shift, which is fantastic. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. And weekend shifts and occasional care for folks who need to go to appointments at LMH and Burton Ash and those other uh, programming uh, and places in, in our area. Um, but what we're hoping we can do is use that uh, uh, our, our uh, partnership with Peasley Tech to train the next generation of early childhood care providers. They'll do their classwork with Peasley. They'll do their internship and their practical work at, uh, their, at the Early Childhood Care Center. And then hopefully they'll go on and start their own care centers in Douglas County. So uh, that's, you know, we're taking the crisis at a couple of different levels. Yeah, you are working so hard and appreciate you so much and everybody over at the center. Um, I always begs the question of, are there state qualifications for people to do early child care? And are there preferred that maybe aren't mandated, but what we would like to see 
people have achieved. You were talking about Peasley Tech and a certification. So I'm curious about that educational sort of, sort of that gap of, yeah. of what's what's the best and what's mandated. Well, right now there, it's a it's a moving target because the you know the, the, the early childhood care providers are really doing this as a, a labor of love. I mean, the, unfortunately, mm-hmm. they can't charge more because parents can't afford to pay more. But we all know inflation is jacking up things like food prices, which affect them directly, and uh, the, the cost of supplies and 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 care. And so you you have uh, you know an average minimum wage of around $12, uh, which is very much on the low end, and they often have no benefits. So what you have then is a, a lack of uh, a lack of people going into that field. Now, this is kind of a fluid situation. You're asking about licensure because the state legislature, uh, Governor Kelly, has made it a real priority to put early childhood as something important to her and her administration, and they are looking at options to make it easier for folks to get into child care, and some discussion about that has been licensure. So I feel like what's true today um, might not be true tomorrow, but you do have to get a certificate, but I think where the more important uh, issue lies is that even with getting the certificate, you have folks who just can't afford to deliver that high quality care because they are trying to balance uh, very limited resources that they have um, with um, the fact that they can't actually, you know, in order to, to provide that high quality care and get that continued support, they have to pay money themselves and they just don't have the funds to do that. So you end up with kind of a mix. Sometimes you'll get, you know, my, my first child care provider was wonderful, but it was very much a situation where uh, my kids went in he, he there was the the infant area and then the toddler pens and the toddlers were in front of the tv and it's like it was more of a kind of a daycare right. uh, babysitting yeah. situation than an actual learning and an educational environment but what science shows us is high quality care provides overall much better lifetime outcomes in terms of employment opportunities educational opportunities and overall uh, lifetime earnings so the sooner we can move to a high quality care model the better and that's going to be part of what we're doing with that training is moving towards that high quality quality care. Will Averill with Community Children's Center, I know you guys are trying to do that, but I also am very aware that uh, spaces are limited and that there are a lot of kiddos out there that are falling through the gaps. And I just wonder what we're going to do. You know, what what is the answer when you talk about overhead uh, being expensive to really do it right, which is mm. kind of what I was getting at, and um, what people are paid to do that because parents can't afford Board to pay a lot for child care, especially when they're working minimum wage jobs. Yeah, yeah. And, and an infant, the average uh, cost of infant care is $1,100 a month. So you are looking at a year's worth of care as equivalent to college tuition. And people don't plan for it because you don't think about it that way. I know I didn't, and I thought it was a pretty wise older parent. Um, and so it, it hits folks at a real vulnerable time, and they also need this usually pretty quickly or immediately. Um so it, it, it's a situation where it can catch a lot of people off guard and suddenly become an issue that they have to deal with now. And that creates kind of a sense of panic and people will go to any option. And so therefore, you know, putting that educational thought, the thought into the educational aspect of it can tend to come second if we're not careful. But we believe that every child in Douglas County should have access to high quality early childhood education. And that is our goal. And 138 spots is still just a drop in the pan. But we are hoping with this innovative, you know, sort of training solution and also with working with local businesses for them to provide child care as a benefit to their workers by reserving slots at our care center, that'll allow us to have some slightly additional funds to be able to pay child care providers at the level of a kindergarten teacher. Well, and I love the fact that you're working with Peasley and trying to get people interested and get them trained up. And that's uh, another another piece of the puzzle and we just have to work at it as you said we're going to have an influx Mm -hmm. of a lot of people and a lot of families as panasonic goes in and some of the other industries and that's that's just the reality of what we face but for everybody to have some fun saturday seems to be the day you guys do some other stuff i was noticing that there's the scavenger hunt on Saturdays? That looks like so much fun. <laughs> well, we okay, so the scavenger hunt this year is probably not going to be till October, but it's called Community Quest. Last year was our first uh, first s- s- attempt at it, and it went really, really well. We had uh, about uh, 12 teams and sent them all over town. You know, it's like take pictures of yourself in front of this fa- this landmark or <laughs> do a silly dance on the steps of the Carnegie Building or, you know, just have various locations. And then there's a passport hunt, so we connect with local businesses, and they have stamps, and they 
they stamp the passport. Oh, so. what fun! Uh, and then I like to have uh, what we, uh, I, I, my own little nerd, uh, it, it, Lawrence Nerddom is a treasure hunt with Clue Cameron, who is a takeoff on Hugh Cameron, the famous, uh, well, he's not famous enough in my opinion, but the local Lawrence, uh, one of the first Lawrence eccentrics. Uh, he would walk to Washington, D.C. and back every election season to vote, and he lived in a treehouse down in the Pinckney neighborhood. Uh, real interesting dude around the Civil War time, so uh, his name was Hugh Cameron. So my father plays him, and we changed his name to Clue Cameron and delivers uh, <laughs> three or four clues that are, are uh, texted yeah. out to everybody during the event, and so they gradually can get closer and closer. Um, and the, the, the clue is an actual physical gift certificate um, that's somewhere in town, so that's fun. Sometimes I think people that work with kids do what they do because – they have as much fun as the kids do. I'm not saying naming any names here. <laughs> Yeah, we have a couple of great programs for uh, early childhood, too, called Grow and Go and um, Sing and Sign. And Sing and Sign is, is basically sign language for uh, babies and, and, and early toddlers to kind of get them oh, communicating. Great. And it's amazing. It's run by our community engagement coordinator, Erin Lawrence, and she's fantastic. Uh, but the Grow and Go, we have, like, block fest play and sing along times. And I'll go over there to take some photos as the, you know, director of communications and marketing. Um, and I'll end up playing with the blocks for, yeah. you know, 20 minutes and goofing with kids. And I, and I got to tell you, it is, you know, not every job you get to do that. And that is a fantastic perk of this this role. So I love it. I'm sure you do. And yeah. good, because I think when we do things that are our passion, that's when we do our best selves and we do our best work. I really like the idea of training little ones how to do sign language. I wish somebody had taught. I mean, I learned it when I was young. But, yeah. you know, when in that particular time of life, you absorb stuff better, languages and all kinds of things much, much better than when you get older and things in your mind get a little more rigid, you know. Yeah, that, absolutely. What, what she's tapped into is that singing, uh, you know, as you oh, know, absolutely. Um, it, it, it puts things in your mind as well. It makes it easier to remember things. So if you sing a song with move motions, you're more likely to remember those motions and then you connect those motions to what they mean. So it's a pretty cool program. I just did a talk on memory and, and music and I just... I was looking at adults, and they were kind of a little bit of a blank face. And I went, okay, here's the deal. Mm-hmm, good. Mm-hmm, good. And everybody was like, they knew exactly. <laughs> right. So there you go. The yeah, advertisers yeah. tapped into that because they know that that's how you're going to remember their product. You will for the rest of your life. When somebody sings that, we'll know exactly what that refers to. Exactly. Or like how I can't remember what I ate last Tuesday, but I can remember every lyric to every punk cassette <laughs> I had from when I was in junior high school, right? If you had me do that, I could absolutely go yeah. back and do it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it definitely gets in your brain. People ask me, how do you remember all the lyrics to those songs? And I'm like, because I remember the tune. If I sing it in my head, the, the words just come. But, yeah. you know, so I digress a little bit, but that's okay because I think this music is such a – huge part of the learning experience that is so necessary. And I've seen people, um, when we talk about STEM and, and the STEAM and some of those things, I'm like, just don't let the music go. Because yeah. the music is something that is as much of a team effort, teaches you so many things that um, it is, and it's science too, quite frankly, because frequencies and what you hear in your and sound and what you associate with sound can be a great teacher. Okay, so... It is a fun Saturday morning for us, and Will Averill is here to say it again. That yeah. what, we, what are we doing on Saturday? Early Childhood Family Resource Fair at Kennedy Early Childhood Center. That's 1605 Davis Road, uh, across from the Douglas County Fairgrounds. Uh, we are, it's a free, it's absolutely free of charge. Um, come on in. We're going to have over 45 different um, folks who work in early childhood care to provide you information, support, and services. We're going to have block fest play we're going to have coffee by our friends at uplift coffee uh i hope i can get a little plug in there and um we're going to have some uh some some pastries by from mclean's and it's going to be a good time you're, you're going to really uh you, you can come learn more about our, our organization learn more about what we do but also learn about the work of all of our amazing partners in the community one thing i just want to kind of end with is this idea that you know partnership between nonprofits is very important to me because i feel like we're all doing good work and it's best when we can figure out uh, amazing and interesting ways to to do it together. So a uh, big shout out to Ballard Center who just had the governor come for their groundbreaking and our friends at Wasn't uh, that other cool? Places. Yeah, oh, yeah. So uh, I think you're going to hear more about early childhood uh, throughout the course of the next sort of 12, uh, 12, 24 months. And if you have any thoughts on it, we'd love to chat with you. So get on. And how do they find you? Uh, well, you can find us at communitychildrenks.org. 
the one of the world's longest websites ever, communitychildrenks.org. Do you guys have a Facebook page? We do. We have a Facebook page. It's Community Children's Center. Okay. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, feel free to stop by on Saturday. We'd love to see you. Say hi. I'll be there. You can be like, I heard you on the radio and I'll feel famous. You are famous. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, I'm infamous and you're famous. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you. Famous. Thank you so much for <laughs> yeah. coming. I appreciate you very much. We're going to take a break in just a moment to go to Fox News, but I also wanted to give the last of my barbecue bills away. Smoke in the Spring, Kansas City Barbecue Society sanctioned contest and state barbecue championship is today and tomorrow in Osage City and I have the barbecue bills for you. You can text us at 785-843-1321. 785-843-1321. Just text on your phone and say, I want the tickets, and we'll let you know if you're a winner. How about that? Wouldn't that be fun? So they've got tons of teams. There are even three from Canada. Who knew Canada barbecued? Well, they do, and they're coming down. So Friday night, smoke in the spring weekend includes a giant public barbecue, and it's a big party. Everyone gets a taste of Osage City. There you go. FM 101. 101- 7 and 1320 KLWN depend on it we're on our way to Fox News it is mm, about 30 degrees outside you know what the next few days in the 70s so keep focused on that the spring is coming y'all I promise I've been out in my garden already tootling around going yes I'm going to plant soon digging in the dirt's on its way we also have much fun to get to with farmers market coming up next week don't you go anywhere it's going to be a great day hi this is Bob Schulte I used to be a morning man here on KLWN, but now I spend my mornings listening to my friend, Kim Murphy on According to the Record, weekday mornings at 8 a.m., right here on FM 1017 and 1320 KLWN. Depend on it. I see farmers in their tractors jamming right now. FM 101-7-1320 KLWN, depend on welcome to your Friday. So our next guest, I uh, was talking to him about music that he likes, and he said Led Zeppelin, and I said, uh, which one? He said, well, one that you used to sing. So there you go. That goes out to uh, some of the guys in the bands that I've played with for so many years. We used to do, we used to close with that one. So much fun, and get you right in, I mean, listen to that. Get you right into your weekend. Hit it. All right, all right. Rick Heschmeyer is in with us this morning, and the uh, thing on the planet stuff that we're going to talk about is what's coming up on Monday. You've been hearing about it all over the place because it is uh, a very rare occasion. We have an eclipse coming up, and I want to welcome Rick. uh, It's the Astronomy Club of Lawrence, is that right? Astronomy Associates of Lawrence. Astronomy Associates of Lawrence. I'm going to have you pull that just closer to you. There you go. Um, Rick, what are we going to see coming up on Monday? Well, from Lawrence, we're not going to see the total eclipse. We'll see a partial eclipse, but about 90% of the sun's disk will be covered by the moon, uh, assuming there's no clouds. So this is the, I I noticed that NASA actually um, lowered the, no, not NASA. Who was it? A A guy that's a scientist that calculates the trajectory of eclipses. That's what he studies. He said the NASA predictions for the area of totality was actually 600 yards too wide, and it's narrower than what it was, which means all those people that are running down to Texas and in all those places where there's supposed to be the path of totality are going to have to get real close. Well, the the path of totality is about 100 miles wide. So 600 so yards, 600 doesn't yards make much is, difference. is pretty close. <laughs> um, but. That's you know, funny. if you're going to get right on the edge, you might as well just go right to the middle mm-hmm. so you can get the longest duration of totality. Well, you know, they some of the uh, towns and cities along the way, and popula- they, 
the sheriff's office put everybody on alert and uh, because they're expecting so many so many people in and big crowds and all that kind of good stuff. You actually just delivered uh, some of these Eclipse glasses. You want to tell me a little bit about why we need these and, and how do we tell that they're real? Well... Because I'm sure there's a few thousand scammers yes. out there, right? You uh, you don't want to look at the sun ever without protection um, because it'll burn your retina. And we have no uh, pain sensors in our eyes. So you can be burning your retina and not even know it until later when you develop this dark spot in your vision that may or may not ever go away. So, oh, my goodness. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you're safely looking at the at the sun and and eclipse glasses that are made with the correct materials will do that they'll block out 99.9999 percent of the light coming from the sun which will make it safe for you to observe and so how do we know if they're they're real or not so if you look on the back side of the glasses there's a little symbol uh, that says ISO um, yes and that's the international organization that certifies the safety of these glasses um, there are some fakes that are coming over from China just like we had in 2017 but what I from what I've read um, the correct glasses uh, in the little paragraph next to the symbol actually list the address um, and the incorrect glasses don't. Okay. Well, that's, so that's good to know. That's one place that you can look. Okay. Yeah, I was just looking at, at these, and it does. It lists the address. Okay. So what is it so special about this particular event? Well, the, uh, the special part, the most special part takes place in that path of totality when the sun is completely blocked the light from the sun because that's the only time that you can see the corona which is the outer part of the atmosphere of the sun um with with your naked eyes it's so dim that in daylight even though it's still there we would never have a chance to see it and it only shows up when the light from the sun is completely blocked. So I think just just for edification purposes, this type of eclipse is called a... Total solar eclipse. Total solar eclipse when the moon passes. Right, when the moon passes between the sun and the earth. And the eclipse is caused by the shadow of the moon. And there's two different shadows, a really big one called the penumbra and then a smaller one in the center... It's called the umbra. The umbra is where it's total. Everything within the penumbra is partial. That's a very interesting distinction. Um, and so that is, I'm not sure I understand. So the penumbra is this outer ring around the, but that's still the moon, right? That's just, the, but it's the shadow. Yes, and that okay. happens because the sun is a disk, not a point of light. So if you think of the, light coming from one edge of the sun and light coming from the other edge of the sun, the shadows are going to go in opposite directions when they hit the earth. And so it's only in where that moon is completely centered against the disk of the sun where we're going to get that darkest point. And that's, that's why when you look at maps of the eclipse, it has the one dark band that's where the total eclipse is, but then you have the radiating areas out of that where it's 90 percent 80 percent 70 percent and those are the penumbras those are the areas in the penumbra okay i'm i love learning so this is fascinating to me and this is a rare event well it's rare event for any given location you know we were lucky enough to have a total eclipse in 2017 and to have two four years apart uh is is pretty rare any given spot on the earth is only going to experience a total solar eclipse about once every 400 years. But there's two, pretty much on average, two solar eclipses, total solar eclipses, each year someplace on the Earth. It might just not be here. 
So if you want to, really want to follow this stuff, you need to follow where those are going to be and find yourself in those countries and in those places. And there yeah. are plenty of people that chase those. Uh, really? They call them eclipse chasers, and they travel all over the world to see as many eclipses as they can. There's uh, the gentleman that you just mentioned who recalculated the edge. Uh, Fred Espinak is... They call him Mr. Eclipse. He's seen over 30 total solar eclipses. Wow. What is there to study about that? Why, you know, other than, other than the corona, is there more to know? Is there, is there um, something that keeps us in the midst of research on solar eclipses? Well, there uh, maybe not as much as there was 100 years ago when we were still learning about the sun. We still don't know everything there is to know about the sun, but... Uh, while there is some research that goes on, most of this is just, you know, they want to be in the shadow. And okay. so people go to be in the shadow, whether it's they want to take pictures or they just want to lay there. There are there are other effects that happen that are interesting to note. Um, usually when you get to about 95% uh, eclipsed, which isn't going to be quite as much as we'll have here, that's when it gets dark enough that, say, for example, the street lights would turn on. Oh, really? Um, but once it gets to be total eclipse, animals think it's nighttime. Oh, and wow. so the crickets, crickets will start chirping, the frogs will start croaking, the, the birds will fly back into their trees and nest, the cows will walk back into the, you know. They're coming the back barn. to the barn They're for coming, dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the animals don't understand what's going on. So they just, what they do in the evenings is what they do, uh, when a total eclipse happens. Well, you know, there are some, there are traditions too, like the Navajo. I was uh, visiting with a, a Dene member and she was talking about the fact that they don't go out into it, mm -mm. that they actually find a place inside a, away from all the windows and meditate, and they don't eat, and they don't drink during that time. So it's just, it's interesting how how big an effect that that has both on science and culture at the same time. So what are the associates going to do? What are the astronomy associates? What are you guys going to do? Well, a lot of us are going to be chasing the shadow. Yeah? So, uh, You're going to get on get on the road, huh? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, well, we were, I was originally planning on going to southeast Oklahoma, but the weather's... A little iffy down there so we pivoted and now we're going to go down to southeast missouri okay i know there's a few other people from the club that are headed in that direction um so down around cape Girardeau, down in that area yeah i'm going to stay away from cape Girardeau just because so many people are going to be there yeah. but yes in that general vicinity because oklahoma i think is ha has some cloud cover coming yes Maybe at least storms. that's kind of southeast corner so okay what time yeah, I'm not. I some of us have to work, so I'm no, not getting I, on the road, taking a taking a little lunch, and you know, a little bit of a little bit of V time. But going to go do the thing. But so, what are we going to see here? So there is going to be an event here. It's going to be up at the old marching band practice field, uh, just west of the lead center and and the Dole Center, and that's going to run from twelve to three thirty in the afternoon. The maximum eclipse in Lawrence is going to be at about. 155 okay ish in the afternoon okay so we'll get a chance to see some of it and how what percentage did you say we're going to see about 90 percent here well that's you know that's pretty good it's oh, not it's, the full thing but it's pretty good yeah well i've heard people describe it as saying you know it's like taking a a trip across the country to go see the grand canyon and then staying in the car when you got there oh well <laughs> <laughs> So tell us how to get to the Lawrence Astronomy Associates uh, page so that we can find out more. Well, you can just Google Astronomy Associates of Lawrence, and the first couple of things a little pop up will be our Facebook page and our and our website that's hosted by the Physics and Astronomy Department. Okay. Well, listen, Rick Heschmeyer, I thank you for being my astronomy expert and being willing to come in. I knew I couldn't catch you on Monday. I knew you'd be out <laughs> in the field somewhere, so I do appreciate you coming in today. And uh, when we have more stuff coming up with the group, please let us know because we want to stay informed and stay on top of what's going on in the heavens. I'll do it. All right, sir. Have a great day. All right, you too. 8.52 this morning. We're on our way to Fox News. Got a couple of announcements, so we'll take a quick break and come back. It's going to be a great day. FM 1017, 1320, KLWN. 
This is the uh, press release that came out that I had asked, or someone had actually asked me if I would uh, read that. One of our listeners wanted to know the update. So here it is. This is uh, the story about Cole Brings Plenty. He's still not been found, and the Lawrence Police Department continues to ask for your help in locating him. The drone team worked most of the afternoon south of town yesterday to try to cover the ground quickly, hoping to uncover any leads. They're following up on all the calls and information coming in. Close contact with the family who are very concerned as the days pass and are collaborating with the chapter of Lawrence, the MMI WG2ST chapter of Lawrence. The detectives continue to follow leads since the events that occurred Sunday morning. The details of the incident are not going to be discussed. Bring Plenty's car was last seen on Highway 59, headed south out of Lawrence. He drives the 2005 Ford Explorer bearing Kansas license plate 368PXB. If you have any information, please call 785-832-7509 or the tips hotline at 785-843-8477. And we will keep all of the folks involved in our prayers. Coming up on 9 o'clock this morning and sunshine on the way for the weekend. Just put a smile on your face and keep goodness in your heart and know that we do live in a fantastic place. We are so lucky. Have a great weekend, y'all. It's going to be a great day.